Acts, chapter 25. Three days after Festus arrived in Caesarea to take over his new responsibilities, he left for Jerusalem, where the leading priests and other Jewish leaders met with him and made their accusations against Paul. They asked Festus as a favour to transfer Paul to Jerusalem, planning to ambush and kill him on the way. But Festus replied that Paul was at Caesarea and he himself would be returning there soon. So he said, those of you in authority can return with me. If Paul has done anything wrong, you can make your accusations. About eight or ten days later, Festus returned to Caesarea and on the following day he took his seat in court and ordered that Paul be brought in. When Paul arrived, the Jewish leaders from Jerusalem gathered around and made many serious accusations they couldn't prove. Paul denied the charges. I am not guilty of any crime against the Jewish laws or the temple or the Roman government, he said. Then Festus, wanting to please the Jews, asked him, Are you willing to go to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there? But Paul replied, No, this is the official Roman court, so I ought to be tried right here. You know very well I am not guilty of harming the Jews. If I have done something worthy of death, I don't refuse to die. But if I am innocent, no one has a right to turn me over to these men to kill me. I appeal to Caesar. Festus conferred with his advisers and then replied, Very well, you have appealed to Caesar, and to Caesar you will go. A few days later, King Agrippa arrived with his sister, Bernice, to pay their respects to Festus. During their stay of several days, Festus discussed Paul's case with the king. There is a prisoner here, he told him, whose case was left for me by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the leading priests and Jewish elders pressed charges against him and asked me to condemn him. I pointed out to them that Roman law does not convict people without a trial. They must be given an opportunity to confront their accusers and defend themselves. When his accusers came here for the trial, I didn't delay. I called the case the very next day and ordered Paul brought in but the accusations made against him weren't of any crimes I expected. Instead, it was something about their religion and a dead man named Jesus, who Paul insists is alive. I was at a loss to know how to investigate these things, so I asked him whether he would be willing to stand trial on these charges in Jerusalem. But Paul appealed to have his case decided by the emperor, so I ordered that he be held in custody until I could arrange to send him to Caesar. I'd like to hear the man myself, Agrippa said, and Festus replied, you will, tomorrow. So, the next day, Agrippa and Bernice arrived at the auditorium with great pomp, accompanied by military officers and prominent men of the city. Festus ordered that Paul be brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all who are here, this is the man whose death is demanded by all the Jews, both here and in Jerusalem. But in my opinion, he has done nothing deserving of death. However, since he appealed his case to the emperor, I have decided to send him to Rome. But what shall I write the emperor? For there is no clear charge against him. So I have brought him before all of you, and especially you, King Agrippa, so that after we all examine him, I might have something to write. For it makes no sense to send a prisoner to the emperor without specifying the charges against him. My reflections on this passage are about what we can do when we're falsely accused. Have you ever been falsely accused of something and how did you respond? At some point in our lives, most of us have been accused of something that we didn't do. When this happens, how should we react and how does the Bible teach us to respond? When we're falsely accused or wronged in some other way, we always have an opportunity to bring the glory back to God by following the examples of both Paul and Jesus. In this chapter, Paul finds himself on trial for his life, having already served two years in prison for something that he didn't do. And yet we don't find Paul sulking, seeking vengeance or acting bitter towards his accusers. Instead, we see him following the example of Jesus and turning the other cheek to them. I find it really hard to turn the other cheek, particularly when I feel like I'm in the right. My first instinct is to either become passive aggressive or to try and defend myself. 
and yet God calls me and all of us to a higher place. In his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. In Paul's letter to the Romans, in Romans 12, he wrote, Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. These two scriptures tell us what to do when we're falsely accused. One, turn the other cheek, and two, leave the revenge to God. This can feel like a really big ask when others have hurt us or brought pain to those that we love. As Christians, however, we need to understand that God knows what he's doing and we need to trust in his plan. A couple of questions to conclude. Do you notice how you react to people who wrongly accuse you? And how often do you turn the other cheek? We cannot control what other people say about us or how they act towards us, but what we can control is how we react to them. Instead of returning evil with evil, we can obey these scriptures by following the examples of Paul and Jesus, who call us to turn the other cheek and leave the vengeance to God. This may seem different, difficult or unusual, and that's okay. As God's people, we are called to be different. God's light shines through us and it shines brightest during the darkest times. I'm gonna finish up and pray now in the words of Martin Luther King. And now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and lift us from the dark valley of despair to the bright mountain of hope, from the midnight of desperation to the daybreak of joy, to him be the power and authority forever and ever. Amen. Oh,